My name is Dr. Tia Lights. I'm a principal, a professor in Boston, as well as a member of the Think Kids Advisory Council for Massachusetts General Hospital. And here is... Stuart Ablon. Hi there. Very nice to see you all. Thank you for joining us. It's a great pleasure to present alongside uh, Tia today. Uh, I am a clinical psychologist. I run a program called Think Kids in the uh, Department of Psychiatry at Massachusetts General Hospital. And uh, we're not going to waste any more time on bios. We've we got a lot to talk about today. So uh, let, let's kick things off. So the main reason why we're here, and I'm just grateful to see all of these faces, is to truly talk about what the school to prison pipeline is and the strategies of dismantling this pipeline. So here is the definition, which refers to the practices and policies that push children, especially children from underserved populations, out of school and into the juvenile and criminal justice systems. Just by a show of hands, are you familiar with this topic? Do we know people, students, members of our own family who have been involved in this type of negative system? <laughs> Look at all these hands. That is why this work is so important. So I'm a principal in a community where 99.9% .9 of my students that I serve all identify as people of color. Specifically in my school, 88% of those students being Black students. So they're highly affected by this conundrum. This is the breakdown of who is most affected by the school to prison pipeline. Black, Latinx, Asian, biracial students, English language learners, undocumented, homeless, or fostered youth, students that identify as LGBTQIA youth, or students who are physically or developmentally dis disabled. All of these students make up tons of our school communities and populations, and they're within our edu educational spaces day in and day out. So now, what causes this challenging behavior? I'm just gonna kick off the beginning of stepping back a little bit and thinking about, as Tia just said, what leads to the type of challenging behavior that often is met with practices, disciplinary practices, that result in this so-called school to prison pipeline. And uh, I've basically spent the last 30 years at this point trying to answer this question, which is what causes people to exhibit challenging behavior, and in this case, students in schools, what causes challenging behavior? And what I've found over the years is that the answer to this question for most people it is guided by something I refer to as conventional wisdom, basically thoughts that are passed down from generation to generation. And like all forms of conventional wisdom, they sort of die hard, even after they've been disproven. Uh, the idea that the world is flat is a good example of conventional wisdom. For a long, long time, people believed that the world was flat, long after science had disproven it, long after we realized you can't step off the end of the earth, people held on to that notion. Well, the same is true about challenging behavior. People hold on to beliefs that are wrong, that have been disproven. And in my view, most of those ideas flow from a way of thinking that I'm going to summarize here that sounds like this. Kids do well if they want to, or applied to students, students do well if they want to. And what that means is if you believe students do well if they want to, and a student isn't doing well, maybe exhibiting challenging behavior, you're going to assume the reason they're not doing well is because they don't want to. And if your assumption is that they don't want to do well, well, then guess what you're going to try to do? You're going to try to make them want to do well. And I imagine to this crowd at a conference like this, this sounds sort of simplistic, um, but the reality is traditional school discipline is all oriented around trying to make kids want to do well. And in fact, we have all these fancy things we do. We have functional behavioral analyses that we do, where we've got to check a box as to the function of the kid's behavior. And what do we generally say? Well, we say the behavior is either going to be oriented at getting the kid something or getting them out of something. And it's not rocket science, right? Like, we think kids are trying to get what? What's a good example with challenging behavior? Attention. And what do we think kids are trying to get out of? Work. So, but it's no surprise if those are the two options you have for checking a box for why the kid's behaving this way, if those are your options, those are going to lead us right in the direction of carrot and stick approaches. 
trying to motivate kids to behave better, safe in the assumption that their only thing they're lacking is motivation. And this is true despite the fact, folks, that there's actually been thousands of studies, I'm not exaggerating, thousands of studies that have shown beyond the shadow of a doubt that when you use a carrot on a stick to try to incentivize somebody, motivate somebody to do something, what happens to that person's internal drive to achieve the goal? Anybody got any idea? What happens to their drive? You got it. It goes down. And by the way, not just down a little, down massively. There's a strong negative correlation between a reliance on external reinforcers and the development of intrinsic drive, which is sad and scary because as educators, you all know, what's perhaps the most important thing you're trying to impart in students is intrinsic drive, internal drive to learn. So the last thing you would want to do is use disciplinary practices that actually decrease those very things. And I got to say, I'm just going to be real direct with people here. These days, people talk a lot about positive discipline, which in my view is mostly marketing. Because when they say positive discipline, you ask people to explain what they mean. They're like, oh, you know, we just use rewards and incentives. Like, we don't use punitive discipline, like consequences. But then if you dig into that a little bit, you're like, well, what do you mean? Like, oh, you know, like we have good behavior Fridays and like things kids can earn. And what I say then is, so what do you call it for the kids who don't earn those things? Because where I come from, I call that a consequence. Like, I call that a punitive response. So it's really sort of marketing, honestly. Now, um, <laughs> if this is bad news so far, here's the good news. Just like the world is flat, that notion, um, all forms of conventional wisdom, or almost all of them, end up being wrong. They almost always end up being wrong. In other words, they are disproven. And the reason they're disproven is these notions we have, they aren't driven by scientific understanding. Conventional wisdom tends to flow from bias, not from science. And why do we hang on to these biases? Again, I'm going to just be real direct with folks here. I think it's because challenging behavior is incredibly difficult to deal with. And it pisses us off. And we seek power and control, and in some cases, revenge, to try to sort of get back at a kid and get the classroom back under control. But really, we're not operating with the smart part of our brain at those points. We're pissed. And we make up rationalizations for why those kinds of disciplinary practices are OK. But the reality is that they don't flow from a scientific understanding of why kids struggle to manage their behavior. They flow from bias, not from science. And in fact, they flow from two forms of bias. They flow from explicit bias and implicit bias, which means all kids get hit with bias. Some kids, as Tia is going to walk us through in detail now, they get hit with what I call double jeopardy of behavior bias, because they get hit with explicit biases and implicit biases that all send us down this path that ends with the school to prison pipeline. So let's get into bias. This one is any type of bias in our transparency moments. I want to turn my back. Have you ever um, had a bias that you've developed in either one of those ways? Raise your show of hands. Me too. And I'll talk about it later. I'm sure there's so many biases in me. I'm principal. I'm black. I'm a woman. I'm young. I have tattoos. I do my thing. And I'm sure that when I step into those department meetings, they're like, this lady right here? Bias. <laughs> so, explicit biases. Attitudes and beliefs we have about a person or group on a conscious level. We are fully aware of, the, of these biases. So they can be self-reported. So I'll give an example of my own, and which I'll talk about later. As a black teacher turned into a black administrator to a black principal. Previous years, I thought, I know exactly everything that black kids need. Because I am black and they know it and we have the same experiences and we can get this done and blah, blah, blah. That was filled with bias. And that was my explicit bias. I verbalized it. I said it a lot. I told the parents that. I, I told my team that. Because that's what that's what was in my heart at the time. That's what I led with. Now the implicit bias. These are our unconscious attitudes that lie below the surface 
but many influence, but they may influence our behaviors. So across my time as a school leader or and or as a teacher, I've seen these come out way more than the explicit bias. So I'll give you an example of the implicit. A teacher is setting up for a test. All of a sudden, one there's two seats, one in the corner and one over there, and two kids have to go and sit over there to take the test, but not over here with the rest of the kids to take the test. So when I go into the classroom, I'm saying, I wonder what bias is happening here. I look at the students, they are either black and brown, they think they can't do it, they think their behavior will be bad. That's not verbalized. It's just you're using it, it's what I feel, it's what I think. I'm just going to slightly take the action to, you know, make sure that I can dismantle this and do this. And then here I'm going to come back and teach the rest of the class. Those are those type of biases that destroy systems in schools for kids. Tia, yeah, just a quick, quick note. Whenever yeah. you're talking about these differences, I say to myself, you know, if you went and asked that person it, or pointed out that bias, they would say to you, oh, oh, no, I don't have that bias. In fact, it's real, sometimes people will say, I don't have implicit biases, which you got to laugh at because, of course, the definition of an implicit bias is you don't know it. Mm -hmm. It is unconscious. Um, but anytime anybody's sort of denying that they don't have bias, you got to say to yourself, um, hold the show here, folks. Okay. So here is some more examples of explicit bias, the ones that are in the forefront. They're loud. They're right there. We, we say them. We move with them. They, they're clear, transparent. That kid behaves poorly on purpose. They just want to get out of doing work. We just kind of did that example. <laughs> this parent has poor parenting skills because they have a challenging kid. Counselors have said that. I've heard people say that. This group of kids cannot read in the fourth grade because their parents are poor. Ridiculous. This family is wealthy, so their child will do great in school. And as a former private school teacher, trust me, all of the rich kids was not getting the best grades. Implicit bias. Here's some more examples of the ones that are kind of, you know, we don't talk about them. We don't aren't even aware of them half the time. More harsh punishment for kids of color or kids from low-income families or neighborhoods. Parents of color or from low-income families. So even that is the bias. You have to be low-income and a person of color. So it's double. Or neighborhoods will be less cooperative with educators. Believing black students are aggressive and unmanageable in classrooms. I'm pretty sure when I was uh, seven, eight, nine, that was for me. Anticipating that the students of color will not meet grade level expectations because of their race. All of those are implicit bias, and those things are hurting, destroying the positive things, the positive cultures that we're trying to create in schools. Implicit bias in schools can lead to a plethora of things. Bias evaluations for students. In evaluations, it could be testing, could be saying that the student has a behavior challenge, not necessarily directed to their academics, so they're saying, put this child on the track to get an IEP or 504, or you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, as teacher talk goes. Significant learning gaps. Gaps are everywhere, but these right here, most of the times are led by these biases in school. Lack of interventions to elevate student achievement. How many teachers are here? So take RTI, right? Do RTI. That's a, that's a pivotal intervention for ELA, math, history, and science. So when we automatically think a student can achieve, they may go to the lowest RTI group and not get what they need or they just get pushed aside so that they're not being evaluated and getting that intervention correctly. Now, punitive discipline or disproportionately applied, or disproportionately applied to kids of color. So they receive punitive discipline more often, are more severely disciplined, and receive harsher punishment for lesser offenses. So, examples. At my school district, in, within my school, I don't believe in suspending a student. All of us are human beings. We've had a bad day before. Maybe we've kicked a pencil over or, you know, in the morning I'm getting frustrated, I'm not dressed on time, I'm a little late. Those things in schools are used as tools to get students out of schools to get them punished. And where do they end up? On the school to prison pipeline. Just from those smaller things that can grow and grow and grow into these bigger negativity. So let's get into some numbers. Here we go. White students you see here, black students you see here. Zero 
tolerance discipline has resulted in black students facing disproportionately harsher punishment than white students in public schools. So I really want you to take a look just at this example. Here, 51% of the students are white, public school enrollment, and 16% of the public school enrollment is black students. But look how the numbers are here. If 16% are black, this number is 42%. Basically all, multiple suspensions lead directly to the school to prison pipeline. Why? Because their record is tarnished. Not the record, not just record that they're getting on a piece of paper, but their internal record. How they feel about themselves. How can they grow when somebody is always zapping them, zapping them, zapping them, zapping them. And this is what happens. So then they get used to it. And then it becomes to them, their mind, it's okay. Numbers. I love numbers. So black students represent 31% of school related arrests. 31%. Students suspended or expelled for discretionary violation are nearly three times more likely to be in contact with the juvenile justice system for the following year. So let's take this 31%. There's data that says you can calculate a student being put on the school to prison pipeline in the third grade. How old are third graders? Seven, you know, seven, eight. So these are their first smackdown, right? First thing, violated the school, whatever they were trying to accuse them of. Now that's growing. They're in third grade. So now when they're in fourth grade, how many times do you think it's going to happen to them there? Probably double or triple. By the time they're in fifth grade, their mentality is probably so skewed, not just from them, but for people putting these labels on them, and it grows into a conundrum. So when they hit the age of 14, now you can really be arrested in school. And they're not just going to take you to a little center. They're probably take you to a prison. And then what happens to the student's life? We should be mindful of these type of numbers and how fast they can go. This is something that I'm a strong advocate about not using push-out processes or punishment gaps. So a push-out process is when a school leader, administrator, executive director have already used their biases to target a group of students. So when it's time where I'm from Massachusetts, heavy standardized testing state. So when I, not me per se, but I'm just using me as an example. If I'm the principal that says, I need my score to be this high because this is going to bring me funding. This is going to bring me more resources, books, better classrooms. I can move my building. But they're telling me, the school department, that my scores have to be like this. Immediately, the school official, the admin team, the dean's office, we're pushing the pressure on punishment. And we do it specifically around the time that standardized tests need to be taken so that the student will miss the test. A lot of times you've heard like a three strike rule or things of that nature. It's, it's kind of, it's similar to that. It's where they're, the frequency of getting things to either push kids out of the school for expulsion, if they can't get the expulsion, pushing them out closer to times when you need those standardized test scores. All because of the bias you think this student may have a behavior challenge and I don't want them messing up my scores. So in the punishment gap, which is also a conundrum, poor performing students get longer suspensions. It's the same thing. And this oftentimes is led by teachers in the classroom. They will make cases to say, why should this student be suspended for 15 days instead of put him in detention for 25 minutes, right? They miss so much school. What happens when a student misses school? They miss content. They're behind. So when they get back into the school building, do they know what's going on? No. The teacher may feel like, oh, it's an attack. They don't know what's going on. They're asking me all these questions. Yes, yeah, because they don't understand. They've been out of school for 15 days. So that punishment gap just increases the low performance of those um, for those students. So what Tia is describing here, uh, you know, hopefully folks are sitting here thinking how traumatic, how traumatizing this is for students. But it's even worse because you think what we know about trauma now, exposure to chronic stress and trauma, tells us that the very students that we're talking about are already often exposed to chronic stress and trauma in the first place. Okay, so in the last 10 years or so, since we can peer into kids' brains using imaging techniques and things, we see the impact of chronic stress and trauma on kids' brains and development. And you don't have to be a neurobiologist here to see the difference between on the left, you've got a neurotypically developing uh, little toddler's brain. 
On the right, you've got a toddler who's been subject to chronic stress, or in this case, trauma as well. And you see the massive differences in brain development. And guess what those massive differences lead to? Difficulty managing, regulating, controlling your behavior. And then what happens? <laughs> we respond to that with interventions that provide further chronic toxic stress. This is something I've written about that I call the cycle of chronic stress and trauma and punitive discipline. Because I think what happens is, and, and look, during the pandemic, we've got no shortage of chronic stress and trauma, which delays kids' development, which causes challenging behavior. And then when we respond with punitive discipline, guess what happens? It adds stress, further gets in the way of development, which escalates challenging behavior. And how do we tend to respond to escalated challenging behavior? By upping the ante on punitive discipline. And around and around we go. I think this is actually a good articulation of what's behind the school to prison pipeline. Now, again, that's the bad news. Uh, the bad news is chronic stress isn't going anywhere anytime soon. So students are showing up in our schools with serious lags in development, which are causing challenging behavior. But the good news is we don't have to respond with that. Punitive discipline is a choice. We're deciding to respond to those things that way. We don't have to do that. We can do something other than punitive discipline. And in fact, our research, other people's research has shown that if you respond to challenging behavior, not with punitive discipline, but instead with what I'm going to call relational forms of discipline, what do you see? You see less stress in kids and educators. And no surprise, less stress kids and educators make for better learning. And not only do you not see this getting in the way of skill development, you actually see relational approaches build skill. And when you have less stress and better skills, what do you see? Less challenging behavior. And when you have less challenging behavior, it's a whole lot easier to continue to practice relational discipline. So what used to be a negative cycle can become a positive cycle. And what I mean by relational forms of discipline, what we teach one we call collaborative problem solving. I'm going to a session a half an hour after ours finishes. It sounds like it's focusing on restorative practices. These are examples of relational forms of discipline that have been shown to decrease stress, build skills and foster development, and reduce challenging behavior. Okay? Now, um, what the rest of the session really is, is about is knowing all of this. How do we interrupt the explicit and implicit biases that cause people to use punitive discipline instead of relational discipline. And I think the big answer here is we've got to help people listen to science, not to bias. We have to make sure people are aware of the science, not the bias. And what does science tell us? Science tells us very, very clearly, 50 years of research at this point, so this is nothing new, 50 years of research in the neurosciences, has shown us very clearly that students who struggle to manage their behavior, they don't lack the will to behave well, folks. What they lack are the skills to behave well. And what I'm talking about here are skills like flexibility, skills like frustration tolerance, skills like problem solving. These are developmental lags in those areas. Now, um, can you, by the way, can folks here ever think of a time when kids are not particularly good at these things, so they exhibit a lot of challenging behavior, but we don't get too worried about it? Like, what age would you say is there a lot of challenging behavior? Early childhood, right? Like, what age? I got a lot of twos. You work with fives. Yeah, but the reason people call it, a lot of people said twos is we actually have a name for that, right? What do we call it? You got it. Now, we call it the terrible twos because they're like awful, evil little beings. People are like, yeah. Uh, they can be, no, but the reason we call it the terrible twos is because they stink at these things. But the good news is most six-year-olds are more flexible than two-year-olds. Most 10-year-olds have better frustration tolerance than four-year-olds. Most 17-year-olds have better problem-solving skills than eight-year-olds. But you notice the language I'm using? Most. Some kids have lags in these areas of skill. And it's not a lack of motivation. And the great thing about working with educators is y'all already know how to do this because we went through this already with something called learning disabilities. Like 
go back 40 years in time to when I was like, let's say in fifth grade or something like that. If a kid was struggling to read 40 years ago, people didn't say, really caring, well-trained educators didn't say, I wonder if that kid has dyslexia. 40 years ago, what did they think of that kid? They thought the kid was what? Lazy, or let's be really honest, folks, dumb, right? And if it was lazy, what would you do? Try to motivate him to read. Why is that sadly ironic? Because guess who was trying harder than anybody else in that classroom to read? The kid to whom it didn't come natural. So in other words, we already know how to do this. It, this is just a different form of a learning disability, honestly. It's just instead of reading and math and writing, this is things like flexibility, frustration tolerance, and problem solving. And you'd never whip out your sticker chart in 2022 to help a kid who was struggling to read decode words phonetically. No, you teach them alternative strategies to decode words. And if somebody asked, well, how would you motivate them to do it? I would say, well, you'd help them be successful. And guess what? That'll provide the intrinsic motivation that you're looking for. So bottom line here is this is about skill, not will. Okay. And the kids who struggle to manage their behavior in the classroom are actually trying harder than anybody else to do so because it doesn't come naturally to them because they struggle with these skills. And if, you know, people sometimes ask me, <laughs> do I think there are any kids who don't try very hard to behave well? And I will tell them, absolutely. You know who those kids are? The well-behaved kids. Because it just comes naturally to them. They don't have to try very hard. It's the kids who struggle with these skills. So this is, again, where I'm saying we got some real good news here, folks. And, and I bet everybody in an audience like this uh, every, how many people have I show of hands? How many people here have heard of the growth mindset? Everybody raise your hand. Okay, good. Um, all I'm talking about is a behavioral growth mindset, folks. This is about skill not will, which is good news because skills can be built. So when I introduced that notion earlier of what, what drives our disciplinary practices, this philosophy of kids do well if they want to, well, what I suggest is we replace it with a more accurate philosophy. Not kids do well if they want to, but kids do well if they can. If a kid could do well, they would do well. If they're not doing well, let's use science, not bias, to figure out what's standing in their way. It's skill, not will. And then we'll be able to help. Now, as Tia well knows, the problem with this is this all is great, except we don't listen to anything, especially science, when we are dysregulated. And in fact, <laughs> when I'm doing my trainings, usually one of the things I point out is the most important thing we could be trying to work on to serve our kids well is adult dysregulation. Really. And there's no shortage of it during the pandemic. Adult dysregulation. OK. And unfortunately, dysregulation triggers bias for all the reasons that I was saying before. So if we're going to try to interrupt implicit and explicit bias, the real question is, <laughs> How do we combat dysregulation in the first place? The last piece I want to share with you is a little anecdote of how we um, went about doing that, not intentionally, but learning the hard way in one of the toughest settings I've worked in. This is where we were asked uh, to implement our approach with the New York City Police Department uh, many years ago. And uh, y'all, how many people raise your hands here if you have school resource officers, agents in your schools? All right, in New York City, they have over 5,000. Anybody here from New York? All right, uh, you may know this, but guess what? If you guys didn't look particularly impressed by 5,000, but that would be the third largest police force in the United States of America. The cops in the schools in New York City. And this is right where the school to prison pipeline happens. Now, we got called in to work with them because they were getting assaulted at alarming rates when they came into the classroom to deal with disciplinary issues, like hats, hoods, uh, when there was mayoral change, texting in class. These were the things. They'd get called in, invoke their power. It would dysregulate the kids, which would then dysregulate the cops. The cops would arrest the kids. And there you go. School to prison pipeline. OK? Right then and there. Now, here's the interesting thing. So I, I had to um, train 5,000 myself. Um, and we had this great idea, we'll train a thousand cops at a time. That's a really good idea, right? A thousand cops. Uh, and to make it worse, in like a hundred degree weather, 
first week before school uh, at the end of August in an unair conditioned high school auditorium with those wooden back seats, you know, those incredibly uncomfortable. And unlike you all who are used to professional development, I was told the cops, they don't work for the DOE. They work for the NYPD. They went to the police academy. You know, they actually, I was told, um, don't do turn in talks or pair shares <laughs> because you will lose the cops. Okay. Um, and I was also told they're the most unruly group ever and that we have cops there to police the cops in case they get too unruly during the professional development. I'm not kidding. So anyways, long story short, um, I'm doing training with them and I'm covering the kind of stuff we're talking about. And it's all going great until I got to that. It's about skill, not will piece. And this is like a learning disability. And oh my God, you would have, you could not believe the mass dysregulation that occurred. And dysregulation is contagious. So it went from a few people talking and texting to people making phone calls, standing up and shouting, people trying to leave, but the cops were there to police the cops. So they tried to stop them from leaving. I'm not making this up. And the person assigned to me came down to me and asked me whether I was okay and felt safe still in a professional development seminar. Okay. Um, <laughs> this was, this is, by the way, the worst training I've ever done in my life. And my contact for the Office of Safety and Youth Development um, asked me at the end of the day, he's like, hey, do you want to go grab a beer with me and a couple of the agents? I was like, yeah. Uh, so I go out to grab a beer with them. This is the whole reason I'm telling you the story is, um, <laughs> there's a point. Uh, I uh, asked one of the agents, I was like, hey, tell me something. Like, I felt like this training was going pretty well in, in the beginning. And, and he looks at me, he's like, yeah, man, I, I, we were feeling you. And I was like, I, I thought it was going well, but then it like, I feel like I lost you. And he's like, yeah, you did. And this is where I got some serious wisdom from him. Because I just asked him, why did I lose you? And you know what he said to me? Looks at me, he's like, you got to understand something. The behavior that we get called in to deal with, it's dangerous, it's disrespectful, it's inappropriate, and it must stop. And here you come waltzing in making excuses for these kids' behavior. You got it, right? So I had a thousand cops to train the next day. So I go home and I or go to the hotel. I do what any good presenter does. I make a new PowerPoint slide. Uh, and right before I'm going to talk about skill not will, I throw it up there. I go like this. I want to be clear. Explaining is not excusing. I am not excusing this behavior. I am simply explaining it. And you know what? It made no difference whatsoever. It, it was still, it was crazy. It was out of control. So I called one of my colleagues and he had a brilliant idea for day three. He said, why don't you practice a little of what you preach? Because what I preach is starting with empathy for kids. But what about empathy for the cops? So I started my third cohort of a thousand this way in the morning. I started by saying, I just want to be clear about something. The behavior that y'all get called in to deal with, it's dangerous, it's disrespectful, it's inappropriate, and it must stop. And they were like, hallelujah. And I said, I want to be clear. We can't stop this unless we know what's causing it. People are yelling out damn straight, right? Because if we think the wrong thing's causing it, we're never going to be able to stop it. we got to know what's causing it, if we're going to stop it. And we got to stop it, because it is dangerous. It is... You get the whole point, but I, I kid you not, you could hear a pin drop in the place. Their cortexes were open for business. Let the learning begin. I'm not kidding you. And so the most important thing I learned, which of course I already knew from working with kids, but it's the same with adults, the greatest, most powerful human regulator we have folks, is empathy. Empathy regulates. And when you have regulated people, you can interrupt their biases. Dysregulated people are going to be all about their biases. And as proof of this, you can see in those trainings I did with the cops, man, I had to struggle through them. All I tried to do was a basic mindset shift. And look what happened the following year, folks. A 67% decline in summonses issued in school a 58% decline in arrests made in school. And if you're saying, well, is that because the schools were totally unsafe at that time because they weren't doing those things? 
No, 20% reduction in major crimes, 40% reductions in violent crimes. Safer schools without fueling the school to prison pipeline. And it wasn't because they were practicing our approach with great fidelity. It was because they started the school year with a shift in thinking. And kids do well if they want to, the kids do well if they can. So my point here is that understanding challenging behavior through the lens of skill, not will, in and of itself, holds tremendous potential for dismantling the school to prison pipeline. Now, surely it is not enough. Well, that's why I have my colleague here to tell you what else we can do to dismantle the school to prison pipeline. Thank you, Stuart. Now, what other ways? So I'm a principal. I was a teacher. I was all things in school. And I think the real thing that I thought about when I took on a role in administrative leadership team was how are we creating culture in school? How big does culture play within our educational space? So hindsight, Tia, when she's seven, eight, nine years old, I am from the city. My parents bust me to school in the suburbs and I hated everything about it. I felt like I was cannot, I was not connected to the culture. I had no teachers that looked like me. No one understood how I thought uh, me being excited about an answer automatically turned into this loud, disruptive child. And I went through that from kindergarten all the way until 12th grade. So when I had the opportunity to create culture, that's something I never wanted to do. Part of culture for me was having people in spaces that represented the students, what they look like, how they feel, lived experiences who they are, can I connect with you? Do I know that if you're getting dysregulated or frustrated, you don't necessarily have to go out the classroom, maybe you want some water. Can I say, do you want some water? Cool, here's your water and let's keep on going. Those are the things that I did not experience. So school culture is extremely important to me because it communicates to students the school's attitudes towards a range of issues and problems, including how the school views them as human beings. So imagine if you're a parent interviewing for a school. Does anybody ask that? How do you view my child as a human being? We never say that. All we say is, do you have a good test score? Can I get picked up at this time? Do you have transportation? But this is a really important thing. How do you view my child as a human being? My professional practice is looking at my students as human beings because they're people within this world. I do that because of this culture responsive aspect that I live by. So my research. So remember at the beginning when I told you I can, I was still a little am filled with certain biases based on my own life, how I feel, things that have been cast upon me, wanted or unwanted. But I went to school in the suburbs. I'm sure in Boston, suburban people don't look like me. So having that experience when I was in uh, 12th grade, I said I'm going to an HBCU. Any HBCU graduates in here? Goers, doers. Amen. Okay. So HBCU to me, that's where my tribe was. That's where the people I wanted to learn from, they were there. They looked like me. They can understand me. They had lived experiences as me. And I knew I was going to get the best quality education that I needed. And I did. It was amazing. I went, I mean, I'm a doctor. I went to five, four universities. And still, number one, Johnson C. Smith, I don't care where I went, Johnson C. Smith University in Charlotte, North Carolina is my school because they taught me who I was as a person. So here's where my bias kicks in. Now, years later, 20 years later, I'm a principal and I'm saying, hmm, I went to this HBCU. My professors look like me. They gave me everything I wanted. Huh, clearly, when I work in a black school, everybody, every teacher needs to be black. Principals need to be black. Counselors need to be black because black people give black kids what they need. That was my bias. So when I'm up for my dissertation and my research problem of practice comes up, my chairs looked at me like, that's what you want to talk about? <laughs> yes, because I know for a fact, my hypothesis is black teachers, black school leaders, we are the ones that can save the black kids in this community. And that's what my dissertation was about. The influence of black school leaders um, on schools where there's a 95% higher rate, a high rate of black students. So of course, I'm getting my data together, I'm ready to go. I have all of this, this data I'm interviewing and 
recording and sitting down with and getting themes, all black principals across my city and figuring out what they're doing. Then my chair hits me, attach it to a framework, sis. I'm like, a framework? No, I am the framework. This is it. <laughs> like, no, that's not how it goes. So I did my research. I sat went back to the table and I stumbled upon one of the best gifts I've ever received through research, culturally responsive school leadership framework. And when I looked at that, Dr. Muhammad Khalifa, it was his dissertation and it was his time. And when I tell you, it opened my eyes to the change from my positionality of Black leaders bring Black teachers and teach Black kids and that's it. Two, here are these culturally responsive and culturally proactive practices that we all can do, everyone can do, regardless of race, regardless of ethnicity. We all can do these things and that's what I needed to bring to the school. So now my research became twofold. It was, yes, I'm proud to be a Black leader and these Black leaders have these things. These were their themes. These were their themes. But with that, they had the power to give these, but we also have this framework to teach everyone those skills. So my themes were all my Black leadership, importance of Black educators in leaders' individual development, advocacy, setting high expectations, being intentional, building trust, and being extensions of family. Of all of the participants within my research study, these were all the things that they had the same. So I had school leaders that were pregnant when they were 16, thinking that they was going to get kicked out of school forever. But instead, they had a black school leader that said, you think you're getting kicked out? No, no, you have a baby to raise. So you're going to finish this having this baby. You're going to get yourself back in school. And that taught them just a simple thing. You don't give up if something's hard. High expectations, right? They were intentional. Intentionality comes in multiple ways within schools. They built trust. And this was really big. Being extensions of family. Being extensions of family. I pray that when my students look at me, yes, I'm your crazy, zany, wacky principal. But I'm your sister. I'm your friend. I'm your aunt that you need. I can cook you something up and we'll be okay. You know, I want them to see me in that way. So those are kind of like the innate things that Black educators, Black school leaders had, but those skills can also be taught back to skills. Those skills can be taught to, across the board to other educators and school leaders that may not necessarily be Black. So here it is. The culturally responsive school leadership is the ability of school leaders to create school context and curriculum that respond effectively to the educational, social, political, and cultural needs of students and suggests that culturally responsive leaders need to be critically self-aware of their values, beliefs, and dispositions in relation to the students that they serve. So educators in the room, do you self-reflect? How often? Daily, right? We have to. The world is growing. Things are changing. Every day, we have to think about these things. What are our values? What are our values? Because those values, that's what we need to lead with, not our biases. We need to lead with the values and the systems that we're trying to set. So what do we believe? That's important, what we believe. Are we self-aware? What am I bringing to the table in an unbiased way to support the growth of the students in the community that I serve? That's not a black skill. That's not a white skill. That's everybody's skill. Within the framework, and I hope you all are able to look, look the framework up, Dr. Muhammad Khalifa, it's four major buckets. The first, critically self-reflect on leadership behaviors, develops culturally responsive teachers, promotes culturally responsive, inclusive school environments, and engages students, parents, and community, always. So this is not a workshop that you go and say, okay, I'm going to hit all these buckets in this month, and then I'm going to go on, and it's going to be back to the same. These are things that you are always constantly in play. Day in, day in and day out. This is what we're always thinking about. Always starting with your own personal self-reflection. Any principals, uh, assistant principals? Our day starts so early. We forget sometimes to just drink a cup of coffee. I forget to eat breakfast every day. But one thing I can't forget is to reflect on myself in the morning to say, what am I bringing to the table? What values and beliefs are driving this day? Because whatever those values and beliefs are driving this day, 
I pray that they can align with my students and that's going to be how I'm going to get through. Just remember those things. So creeping back into my biases that I have in terms of Black school leaders being a change that the schools need. To me, that's true. Across the nation, what is the teaching population? What is the school leader population? White, middle class women. So that part of me is not going to change. The only thing I can do is be the change to open up the lines, right? So the higher school leadership that mirrors the students and the world. My particular school, Helen Y. Davis Leadership Academy, we are an HBCU themed school. So it's important for me to hire teachers that look like my professors, that look like, you know, our cohorts are named Tuskegee, CMU, you know, Howard. The teachers that we teach there, do they look like the students here? That's, that's my mission. That model doesn't work everywhere, but they are very, very, very diverse schools. They need teachers from across the globe to be in those spaces. And oftentimes, you know, it's something that people don't really talk about, but you have to have a school leader that's fearless enough to say, the teaching lane or school leadership lane is not just for you, but it's for you, 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 you. And that's probably another self-righteousness we need to talk about. But it's true. Classrooms, schools are microcosms of this world. And we need to create students to be global citizens. And the only way we can do that is through differentiating who the students are seeing. For my kids in particular, who I love, got to be the HBCU crowd. So now, in my research, um, the key elements of Black school leadership that I want you guys to take away, if you ever have opportunities for Black leaders to join your school community, I advocate and ride for these reasons why. Setting high expectations to support success. I was a person that wanted to end up being a doctor one day. I had a high GPA in high school, and my counselor still told me, oh, just go to community school and one day you'll figure it out. It was my family to push me in setting the high expectations. So I owe it to my students to set the bar high for them. And I pray you all do it within your school community. Implementing the student's culture into all school experiences. Know your audience. Know those little people or big high schools that you're in front of. Give them what they need to be successful, what they need to grow. How are they going to achieve? As we all know, curriculum grows, it changes. One thing I stopped doing this year, I don't want the curriculum that was from Encyclopedia Britannica. I want the curriculum that's when they turn on CNN 10 every day. Are we talking about that? Are we talking about the, the thing that the community activity that happened down the street that they can connect to, that they can grow from? And I challenge all my teachers to build their lives into, into the classroom. I have a large West Indian population. One of the students said I would love to bring my culture into this space. Can we do a carnival? You know, we can't do it outside. It's COVID. I said, absolutely. Just let me know when it's time to play with the parents. It's those types of experiences you need to give to the students. Serve as not only a school leader, but mentor, advocate, and ally. Principles should not be viewed as the enemy. It should never be us versus them. Because they're trusting us enough to keep them safe every day, to provide them with the meals they need every day, to get their transportation correct, to communicate with their parents, to raise the money so that the school buildings don't close. We're not, we're a team. And we have selfless work to do with giving it all to them. So because of that, we are their leader, but they need us to advocate for them and be their ally. And not just, hey, you know, grace was good and a little shuffle. No, no, no. Do you know when their birthday is? We're able to celebrate those things. Those type of small experiences build community and keep students, you know, where you want them to be. They feel safe within those terms. And lastly, provide access and opportunities that close gaps specifically related to, to the student's race. Let's chuck out those push out processes. Let's put in RTI so that everybody's receiving it. Thankfully enough, in my district, we use something called a DCAP, where teachers teach to all students. You can't tell in a classroom who has an IEP, who has a 504, who comes with this, because we train the teachers to teach them in a particular way so they do not feel that they are not part of this community, but they are have the right to learn. So making sure those gaps are getting closed and figuring out what the gaps are in school. Of course, we hear, oh, the learning gap in this. There's so many gaps. There's gaps with parents. There's gaps with teachers. Just, just figure out the gaps and close all of them. But it takes time, time that needs to be poured into 
because we got time for some questions. Um, and I, I am looking here. I'm just going to uh, look on the app first because people have voted up some things, and I'm sure we're going to have time to uh, to take other things as well. But Tia, most of the questions or comments, here's another one. Oh, thanks. Um, are around uh, some of those push out policies. So, uh, for instance, how does a no suspension policy answer severe behaviors like guns, drugs, et cetera? And then a, a related question is zero tolerance ever justified? Um, so, let me see, let me take a first crack and have you uh, jump in here. Um, you know, I, I think one of the things we got to be careful of is you can't just take things away from people and not give people something else in their place. If you just say, don't do this, but the behaviors keep happening, it actually can get uglier, honestly. So I think what needs to happen is you, you need to install what I refer to as relational disciplinary approaches, evidence-based approaches that have been shown to be able to successfully address those types of behaviors. And to the question about zero tolerance, I, I hope everybody here knows that like uh, many years ago now, $10 million of our money, taxpayer money, was spent studying zero tolerance policies in schools to determine whether they make schools safer. And the answer was, it actually, I saw you go like, this was actually worse than that. It wasn't that they don't make schools safer, they make schools less safe. But we need alternatives. And the alternatives can't, this is the last thing I'll say about this, they can't be what I call spray and pray training, which is sort of the typical thing we, we do in our schools, which is a, a day of professional development on a relational approach. Uh, spray and pray, spray it over people and pray it's going to hold. It, you, you all know that doesn't work. You need to have training that is intensive with follow-up coaching and implementation supports to help meet people make a shift away from something that people have been doing for a long, long time and try to envision something that looks different, is hard, is going to stress your system. It, it's a tough process. can be done, but you got to put resources to it, make it a top priority, and you've got to have an approach, a coherent, evidence-based approach. So those are some of my thoughts on, on that. And obviously, you're, you deal with this firsthand in your own school. So Day-to-day -day, um, practices with no tolerance hard question for me because I see my students not as a group of people. I see them as individual people that bring different pieces to the table every day. So in being their advocate and their ally, I know that. I know who they are. So I have had students to come into my school with a knife or a weapon, right? Do I feel like, oh my goodness, this child is a murderer? No. So it takes me to sit down with them and say, yeah, what are you doing right now? And why is this? But they trust me enough to say, well, this student told me in class they were going to do this. And I was scared, so I brought this. So then the school leader says, well, do I expel the student because he brought the knife to school? What am I going to say to the parent of the student that he brought the knife for? So I have to figure out those systems. And those are case-by-case -case scenarios. I, my personal practice is everything is not a one-size-fit-all model because all the students in my school are different. They all come with different needs. They come from different stories. And guess what? They get mad different ways and they're happy in different ways. And I'm not a, I'm not a warden, you know? I wanna know how I can make you feel safe after this situation. So for me, it's like a restorative process. And probably people in my principal world have been like, oh my goodness, you didn't kick them out of school and do, I didn't. Cause I figured out what they needed. Maybe they need some SEL classes on how to feel, how to firm themselves. So when somebody says boo to them, they know that I don't have to bring a knife to hurt you. How about that? So what are they going to do with suspension? Play video games, right? Play video games. So my thought process is, let me bring the resources. You could get an in-house, yes. But an in-house, I'm bringing you the resources and supports. So you're breaking that mentality in your head. That the next time somebody says something to you that you don't like and you feel like you want to harm them, it's brush off your shoulder because you have the tools. That's another thing. Give the students the tools to be successful in any, every single way. Yes, we're in school. We're giving them the tools to understand their multiplication and their English facts and their vocabulary. But what about the tools they need for this world to feel comfortable just being? Give them those tools, too. So that's my, you know, two cents on no tolerance. Well, and, and Tia, people are asking questions about specific tools mm -hmm. as well. So what would that look like? And I think uh, Tia is bringing up a, a really important point. I would differentiate between SEL approaches mm -hmm. for the entire school and 
tier three interventions yeah. that need to be highly individualized for your most at-risk kid. And which do you need? Both, of course, yes. So what are good examples? You know, there are lots of good examples of SEL approaches that are represented here at this conference. I know tomorrow I'm speaking at the Ruler conference. Anybody here know Ruler? That's a great SEL approach that can be used school or district wide. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're looking for tier three interventions, I'm just going to acknowledge my bias because I spend my career teaching collaborative problem solving. It's an evidence based approach. I also mentioned restorative practices. Those two can go together very effectively. So, you know, those are examples of what I would call trauma informed, actionable approaches mm -hmm. for your tier three kids. It's not that they don't apply to all kids in the school, but they're they're going to be most necessary for the kids who are displaying those high level behaviors. And can I just add one more thing to that, Stuart? Go for it. This is just my in school day to day experience is I challenge my teachers every day to ignite the students. And so when I say ignite, if you give them materials and things, it could be through curriculum things that they're attached to, things that are culturally responsive to them, things that they love. Uh, you know, the kids love social media. I allow my students to write their answers in tweets or podcasts or think that's what they connect to. It keeps them so engaged that oftentimes there's no room for dysregulation because they're so obsessed with getting this point across in their way. It takes a lot of training. You know, old school teachers, they don't like that. No, pen and paper, do this. You know, it's like, no, we got to get in with the times. So I'm very mindful of how our materials are presented to, to the students. Two final things, and we got some last comments we want to make. So two things I saw in there. One was a question about getting police out of schools, um, which, of course, is a wonderful idea. But you can't just take police out of schools. If you want to see, pardon my French, a shit show, take police completely out of schools with nothing else there. You do that in the New York City Department of Education, look out. So you've got to install something else. You can't just take away structures that people are relying on, even if they are ineffective and harmful, right? I want to be clear. Yes, get police out of schools, but we need people trained in approaches that they can utilize. So, and you know, we've talked earlier about kids do well if they can. What about educators do well if they can? Mm -hmm. I mean, educators are doing the best to handle all of these, things, just like police are too, given the tools they have but the tools are outdated. And the last question somebody asked is like, if we had unlimited budget, what would we do? I mean, I, what, what's the answer to sort of spray and pray? And look, there, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's a whole field called implementation science mm -hmm. that will tell you whether you're looking to install restorative practices, rule or collaborative problem, whatever you're trying, Singapore math, it doesn't have to be social, emotional or behavioral, there's a way to go about it. And it takes, it's three to five years of a serious commitment from leadership a ton of training, a lot of coaching, and examining all aspects of school functioning to make sure it's embedded in the fabric of the school. And there's a lot of supports out there within that uh, world of implementation science. Well, I think we're going to stick around for a little while, so please come up and ask us like questions in real life, first mm -hmm. person, if you uh, if you have any that you didn't have a chance to put on yeah. the uh, the app. But we're going to finish up with a few uh, a few final thoughts here. So, um, Thea. so you know, I love this. My brother actually has it tattooed on his arm. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. So I told Stuart that when we first started practicing for this, I'm really the Frederick Douglass. I'm not so much the Du Bois type of person. I'm Frederick Douglass, I'm in your face. Because I need things to be action oriented. So I challenge all of you, don't just sit at South by Southwest, this great experience to get all this knowledge and it goes in your notebook. Make changes where changes need to be made in your own respective spaces. Because those kids, they need it. So be the Frederick Douglass, okay? Be the Frederick Douglass. And, and here's our take home points to be Frederick Douglass. OK, so here's what we want you to take away from the last hour together. All right. We're going to take these one at a time. First, help people listen to science, not bias. It's about skill, not will. We will do it. They will do it if you give them the skills to be able to do. It's about skill, not will. This philosophy, kids do well if they can. I've yet to meet the kid who prefers doing poorly to doing well. <laughs> Show me that kid. All kids want to succeed. Don't fall prey to kids do well if they want to. Try to embrace the notion, kids do well if they can. Leader diversity matters. We cannot have the same people in the front of the schools day in and day out. 
diverse leaders open up pathways for other leaders, other teachers. We're building these small replicas of the world in our school spaces. And that's important because that's how you teach kids how to operate as a global citizen. And of course, it's not just leader diversity that matters. It is also teacher diversity that matters. It's that combination, as Tia illustrated for us, of leadership and at the level of classroom teacher. And lastly, people do well if they can. We'll do well if we can. Be kind to yourself. Stuart mentioned empathy. Have empathy with yourself. You're in the work. You're here. It's proof that you're in the work. People will do well if they can. That's very important. I'm going to say that to myself every day. Tia, you'll do well if you can. And that will be correct. Okay? <laughs> People do well if they can. So just thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this presentation. Um, I'm going to have um, my cards up here. If you ever wanted to learn about an HBCU thematic school model for middle school through high school, with Stuart, collaborative problem solving. And like you said, we'll be here to take any questions or thank you give all you for any coming. contact. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you for the work. Thank you.